Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Matt DeMonico with Manhattan Associates here in Atlanta, Georgia. Today's special presentation uh, will, uh, is titled Maximizing Peak Season Fulfillment Performance, which will be hosted in partnership with Logistic Technologies and Manhattan Associates, and along with guest speakers from leading retailer Belk and retail holding company Tailored Brands. So thanks for joining us. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please take a moment and type them into the uh, question box in the WebEx control panel. All questions, will, all questions will be responded to at the end of today's presentation uh, where we've allocated some time. If you don't have the opportunity to put them into the control panel, you certainly can ask them toward the end of the presentation as well. In order to maximize background noise, if you don't mind helping us out by putting your phones on mute, we'd certainly appreciate it. While we're gonna to attempt to uh, mute everyone during the presentation to avoid the background noise, sometimes we find that one or two people do get, tend to get through and their background noise does come through uh, and it does quite, uh, create, uh, create some disturbance. Uh, one final thing before we get started on today's presentation, today's presentation will be recorded and will be available within 48 hours of uh, the close. Now, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn over the floor to David Hogg, who is Vice President of Business Development with Logistics Technologies. David? Hi, Matt. Thank you very much. And uh, a big thank you to everybody that's taken time to come and attend the webinar today. Uh, it's a thought leadership event, so hopefully you'll walk away with the, the opportunity to gain some insight from uh, a couple of you know seasoned industry professionals and with a little bit of assistance from myself and Amy Tennant. Uh, as Matt says, I'm the Vice President of Strategic Business Development Logistics, delivers multi-carrier shipping systems, and we're a long-term and very close alliance partner with Manhattan Associates. Uh, strategic, I think, at this time of year at season peak means I'm thinking more than one week in advance. Uh, so nothing particularly grand about my job title. Amy, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Good afternoon. Hello, um, I'm Amy Tennant. I'm product manager responsible for Manhattan Active Omni um, store inventory and fulfillment solution, as well as the inventory and fulfillment orchestration portions of Active Omni. Um, so I'll be talking a lot about our uh, integration with logistics and how we leverage uh, logistics from our store solution perspective. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Matt Henry, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, yeah. Hi, I'm Matt Henry. I work for Belk. I'm the second of the two Matts we've got on the panel here, I guess, so I hope that doesn't get too complex. Um, I'm an IT professional. I'm responsible for the warehouse management systems the, uh, and the order management systems, so basically the direct consumer fulfillment. Um, I'm also responsible for all of the systems that support our retail replenishment and supply chain. Thank you, Matt. And lastly, by absolutely no means least, Ashish, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Ashish from Taylor Brands. Um, you might not have heard of Taylor Brands as much as Men's Fair, also Joseph A. Banks. So, Taylor Brands is the parent organization. Um, I'm responsible for the transportation and auto management systems, and I have uh, partially responsibility for the WM portion. And we use Manhattan for most of our products, per se. Um, been in retail industry for almost 20 years now. So, yeah, been through this quite a few times. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ashish. I think I'm the old grey-haired man of the panel, so let's get going before it gets to my bedtime. Uh, the agenda, what we're covering off today, quick introduction to the company so that you're familiar uh, and understand the context of their business. Uh, Amy's going to talk through the alliance and a little bit of background where technology it will be mercifully brief. Uh, and just as mercifully brief, I shall give some context to the omni-channel fulfillment market. Uh, just to sort of, you know, give people a, a quick refresh on, you know, what's happening in the industry that then will segue into a panel discussion where I will be uh, the compare and master of ceremonies and we'll finish off open up to questions. Uh, so Ashish, could I ask you to so just expand upon your introduction and give us a little bit more background to the Taylor Brands business, please? 
Sure. Thanks, David. Um, so, like I alluded in the beginning, Taylor Brands is the portfolio of uh, retail brands. Um, we have um, some of the more famous uh, men's retail brands uh, in Men's Warehouse, Joseph A. Bank, and Moors in Canada. Uh, we also have Joseph Abood as our premier um, designer brand, and KNG Fashion Superstore as our um, family superstore, where you can get all sort of merchandise, and not just men's. Um, as an organization, we have been focusing more and more towards retail, uh, personalized pro product and services for our customers, um, trying to get more into omni-channel. Uh, we have had omni-channel for a long time, but the focus was not as much as it used, uh, as it should have been in the past, but uh, now it's about meeting the customer wherever they are. So omni-channel is a big focus for us. Um, and thirdly, um, price wars are not good for anyone per se. We have been trying to do the best for our customers irrespective of the price, whether it means low price or high price. We just try to meet our customers wherever they are. Um, as of last fiscal year, our revenue was around 3.2 billion as an organization with around 1,500 stores. From an omnichannel perspective, like I alluded, we have um, WM, uh, Manhattan WMOS, um, we have Manhattan DOM, and we have uh, logistics as a shipping solution. We ship from everywhere. Um, if the inventory is in the store, if it's in the distribution center, um, we'll ship it um, to the customer. We, we allow customers to come and pick up from our stores, uh, whether they want to just reserve it and pick it up, or they want to buy online and pick it up. Um, as a lot of you probably are aware, we have a big rental presence as well. Uh, we provide that solution as well. Uh, from a shipping standpoint. Um, we also have personalized product that we ship directly from our factories to the stores for the customer. And uh, we use that as well. Um, uh, from a shipping standpoint, we use logistics uh, TME solution for shipping. Um, we also use our own fleet for delivering products. Again, we integrate with uh, all the different solutions that we talked about. From a multi-carrier standpoint, we are not as much in the US. We don't really use that much of multi-carrier shipping, but as and when needed, we use um, different carriers when whenever the situation arises. Super, thank you very much, Ashish. Matt Henry, could I ask you to give us the, uh, the walkthrough of Belk, please? Yeah, sure thing. So Belk is a department store where uh, we operate in the Southeast of the United States. Um, Kind of picture us as uh, uh, you know one of those uh, stores that sits on the end of a mall. Um, we have an interesting footprint, I think, in our in the areas where we operate because we tend to operate into both large and small uh, urban centers. So we we have stores with a pretty wide variety of footprint and and different offerings on the shelves. Um, I actually think the answer is 17 stores right now. I should have fixed this slide, but uh, there are 17 states. Pardon me, right now, but uh, anyway. Uh, we have uh, 300 locations and we have a growing e-commerce business. Um, probably like a lot of people, our biggest growth is in the e-com sector. And I would say one of our big challenges that uh, is similar to what Ashish was speaking about, which is essentially we're trying to make sure we're able to meet our customer wherever they are. Uh, and we're trying to unify our whole, um, our whole approach to how we engage with the customer. So we, we would like the customer to be able to, um, to not think they're dealing with a different belk when they're at point of sale or when they're on e-com or when they're on the phone talking to a rep or or wherever they happen to encounter us. Um, so we have several different sales channels. This picture kind of covers covers some of those. So retail is a major deal for us. Uh, e-com, big source of growth. Um, we allow buy online, pick up in store. One of the benefits for us there, and I think for a lot of retailers, is that helps to drive traffic into the store. Uh, and you can get uh, more opportunity to engage with the customer there. Um, and then uh, when you're in the point of sale, we have uh, there's different terms we use in our company for this, but uh, endless aisle is one that I've seen in the industries. But essentially, if we have the product anywhere in our network and you're in a store, you can place that order and we'll ship it to your home. Uh, on the fulfillment side, we have a uh, this this picture I think kind of just displays some of the different things we're doing. But we deal with third-party 
vendor for returns, that that partner actually also will ship that returned inventory out to customers if it's in good condition. Uh, if when we get another order for it, um, we have dropship vendors, a pretty significant amount of growth we have in that area. Uh, every one of our stores offers the BOPIS, the buy online, pick up in store option. Uh, right now, half of our stores will do store fulfillment, and shortly, by the end of next year, they will all be capable of doing it. Uh, and then we have uh, three direct-to-consumer fulfillment centers that we use to uh, ship to the customer, and they kind of are split between one that does the majority of the volume of, of just about everything, and then there are two that specialize. One specializes in sort of large, bulky ship-alone product, and the other one in high-value, small type product. So we have a fine jewelry and a ship alone facility in our network. Super. Thank you very much, Matt. So moving along, uh, a, a quick introduction to Manhattan and logistics. So I'm going to pass on to Amy. Hello. Thank you. So uh, most of you, most customers, um, I would say, probably know Manhattan from a WMS perspective. Um, and uh, today, we're we're going to talk about shipping from WMS, shipping from stores, um, vendors, um, leveraging across the Manhattan products. But I want to touch, uh, pause for a moment, and sort of set the context when we talk about the Manhattan Active Omni um, solution and the partnership with logistics and how that ties into our store inventory and f fulfillment solution. So while we'll talk about WMS, TMS, Active Omni, um, I want to set the context around Active Omni. So this is our omni-channel solution encompassing omni-channel from from selling through any uh, through any channel, making promises. Um, what promises can you make? What promises should you make related to inventory and delivery dates? And then moving into fulfillment, so you've made a promise. Now what's the most optimal, cost-effective way to meet that promise um, to your customer? And then we move down into fulfillment, whether it's from DC or stores, and then finally the post-sale service um, with a customer service module and customer engagement. So in the right-hand corner, we have store inventory, inventory and fulfillment, and this is our store application aimed at enabling store associates to effectively and profitably fulfill orders from stores. Um, and this is where our partnership um, comes into play in the context of Manhattan Active Omni and Logistics, um, where we have integration for um, the shipment of orders uh, from stores, so leveraging the stores of fulfillment um, location. So Manhattan and Logistics have partnered to enable our customers to support or easily support multiple parcel carriers from a single fulfillment location, or in other cases, um, we need multiple uh, parcel carriers for different geographies or different zones or even for different products. So we leverage logistics through um, our EPI, which is essentially a set of services um, from uh, for parcel integration that we leverage across WMS, TMS, Manhattan Active Omni for um, ship from store. And so, for example, we have done this so our customers can leverage um, out-of-the-box integration with logistics for um, store shipping and leveraging multiple carriers without the need to integrate individually with each of these carriers. Um, so since partial integration is not standardized, so to speak, um, across the carrier industry. So EP EPI provides a single set of parcel integration APIs that can be leveraged to connect to any shipping solution or carrier. And with MAO, we've integrated with logistics for parcel shipping from the store as well as uh, FedEx and UPS, but any parcel um, carrier integration or shipping system comes through this EPI um, component, so to speak. Super. And uh, Amy, just a, a comment on that. You know, I, I hosted a presentation with a, a US 3PL company, NFI, earlier this year at the Manhattan Momentum event. And they emphasized you know, the importance of EPI in the sense that it, it allows them to add carrier services, use their software and the combination of EPI with Manhattan, almost like a plug and play scenario. So it takes literally hours once you have the solutions active, leveraging the EPI interface. So incredibly important and practical. So 
moving on, uh, I'm going to go through the kind of overview of the marketplace very quickly so we get time to get to the important part of asking questions to Sush and Matt. I mean, everybody's familiar with Omnichannel and it's been absolutely crucial in terms of retail's abilities to compete with uh, the ever-growing marketplace and of course the granddaddy of Amazon, but you know, elsewhere in the world, the Alibabas and Radicans. Uh, and within that, the, the stores become the real differentiator. It's the thing that allows you to do services that the marketplaces can. It brings convenience. And through that kind of uplift in footfall that you know collections and stores, return to stores brings, uh, it allows you to access and tap into inventory and you know allow the demand to be fulfilled. With the additional people coming through the store, clearly we heard from Matt already. Uh, you get additional sales happening, uh, so the whole kind of combination is really healthy from a, a retail perspective to reduce markdowns and maximise profitability from the inventory that you've got. Uh, customer preferences. I mean, the the key message that comes across from these statistics is faster deliver matters faster the level works. And so does the quality of communication when you're dealing with exceptions. So when you look back to that kind of technology interface that we have between our solution sets, you, you've been able to pull back near real-time status messages as to what's happening with the parcels and allowing people then to take pro positive action to communicate with the customers is absolutely key. Uh, and it's not one, one size fits all in terms of service levels. Uh, you know, it's really, you, you guys know better than anybody that knowing your customer base, the products and the service levels, the competition you've got, you need to be able to refine and adjust that. If we look at, you know, unified commerce, so you get these grand marketing themes and strategies that come out. And I've used this from Gartner to give the kind of a very simple framework of how they viewed unified commerce, which is sort of an evolution of omni-channel. And clearly when we're looking at managing season peak uh, and the fulfillment processes, we're really focusing on, on their, their areas around inventory management. And it's the thick red line there saying, here's where all the processes need to operate and function. But it's crucial that not only do you need to have an inventory policy that functions and copes with the changes in season peak, you also need to have a consumer policy, a customer service level, the mandate that your systems are working to, and that they need to be aligned. Uh, and they need, you know, you need the systems that allow you the flexibility to change and adapt to the the, the growth and, and fulfillment that you see, you know, so crucially at this time of year. Uh, the season peak, you know, you know, I'd probably describe it as kind of like the super uber promotional uh, of all time. You know, it, it's just so massive for most of you that, you, you know, things go wrong at this period that can be a huge difference to the annual report and the profit and losses that are reported. Uh, when you look at fulfillment, you know, following on the Gartner strategy, uh, Gartner kind of try to help people understand you know, what's most important for you as a company. Are you in that lovely position of being a cherished brand, you know, where you might be a luxury good or have a very unique products and services that draw people into your business and allow you to deliver and support very complex customer service proposals versus the, the least or the less exclusive your products and services become, uh, I guess, the more commodity like the products and services are, then you begin to look like a fulfillment company where it's critical that you focus on the cost uh, and controlling cost to make sure that you've got the your total control of your supply chain and to protect the margin that comes under pressure in that zone. Uh, so, you know, the short summary is it doesn't really matter who you are, everybody behaves like a little bit of an overlap, but you've got to adapt to reflect the products and the services that you've got in your toolkit. Uh, when you look uh, at customers and the expectations that they have, uh, apart from fast shipping, you know, the next crucial thing is 
and it's it's been just added on in spades by Amazon. Uh, everybody sort of expects things for free. And of course, people on this webinar realize there's no such thing really as free. Uh, somebody somewhere is paying, and it's normally us, uh, or subsidizing that process of fulfillment. Uh, and it's even more crucial when you get to looking at returns. And if you're one of those companies who's focusing on apparel, then clearly returns at this particular period becomes a very significant thing to deal with and to manage effectively. Uh, if you, you know, just emphasizing, you know, hey, it definitely isn't a free lunch. This is a, a, a diagram that's come out from Pitney Bowes last year. Uh, and it gives you a kind of a global breakdown of the volume of parcel shipping that happens around the world, but also that you know it gives some comments about the cost per parcel being shipped. Uh, and the lunch definitely isn't free in the United States. Uh, it's one of the most expensive places in the world for shipping, and so it becomes incredibly important that you leverage the supply chain technologies to control the cost while still meeting the customer service levels that you've committed to publicly. Uh, and finally, you know, the, the researcher, you know, things look really good from a store perspective. This really emphasizes the omni-channel store st story. Uh, you know, you've heard from Matt and Ashish already how critical it is to provide the convenience of collections, being able to leverage inventory, and make it available to the e-commerce world to do ship from stores. And you know, through that convenience, you get the incremental uplift. So it's a it's a really, really important area. Let me now move on to uh, the final kind of thoughts from Gartner. Uh, and here, really, what they're saying is, a, you know, a lot of companies operate tactically. They build supply chain strategies. A kind of a tactical way of looking you know, over a 12 month period. And often supply chain teams don't work particularly well with the e-commerce teams and the teams that own the customer proposition. So the replenishment that's going on into warehouses don't always necessarily reflect the commitments that people are making within e-commerce area. So it's crucial that you bring the, t the various teams together, make sure that they work together to align the plans and that both parties are you know, in synchronization where the replenishment processes, the demand planning processes are fit for purpose for meeting the customer service levels that you're committing to on your websites and in store experience. Right, now, Having done that quick scene setting, uh, we, we move on to hopefully the most interesting part, which is chance to fire questions and hear firsthand how things work. So I'm going to start off with a question to Sheesh and just ask you simply how Taylor Brands have gone about preparing and planning for this year's peak season. If you can give us a little bit of an insight even high level into the kind of the business operations and IT planning processes. Sure, David. Um, so from our standpoint, the preparation for peak starts a while back. I mean, you have to decide on the merchandise first, you have to get that ordered, get it ready into the DCs, then you spread it out to your stores. So the process has been up for a while now. Um, what we are going through now is typically we get like a forecast from what we are expecting to see on our different sales channels. That's where the real on the ground work starts um, is from there. And then we start to backtrack from there and see where the volume is coming from, how much is coming, what are our SLAs to meet there, how much inventory we need to spread out, how much we need to keep in the DCs. Um, and then following that, so that kind of, uh, advises the business operations team in terms of how they need to staff, do they need to have like extra shifts, do, do they need to run a night shift, are two shifts okay, do they need to run seven days a week, all that kind of plays into that and from there we start planning the 
the IT work depending on what we need to do. Like um, we, uh, depending on the time of the day, the time of the the peak where we are, we change our shipping methods to kind of meet the demand and uh, make sure we don't don't miss the commitment that we have provided to the customer. Things like we have to plan for adding extra resources um, just on the on the hardware side to support store fulfillment. Store fulfillment is a big thing, especially for us, given that we have so many stores, a lot of our inventory is in the stores and we do ship from stores. So we need to make sure that uh, the systems that everyone is using for um, their um, order fulfillment are up to the level. Uh, we do a bunch of load tests, both from end to end, starting all the way from e-commerce or point of sale all the way till um, just doing for individual store user, how, what experience they are going to get when the load load is so much. All that kind of plays out, uh, but all starts from the forecast that we get from Ecom uh, and the forecast we get from our sales channels. And from there we work, work our way forward. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, Matt, uh, can you give us a little bit of insight into how you go about doing this at Belk? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Ashish did a good job of laying out um, the whole process, especially leading up to peak. Uh, I, I wanted to comment on a couple of things that happen as sort of the differently for our business during peak that may be of some interest. One of them is that our our stores hire dedicated staff for store fulfillment during the peak period. Not some stores have that all year round, but most stores do not. Uh, and the reason we do that is the store volume starts to absorb some of the growth that we have in sales. Uh, during this period so they can kind of take a little bit off the top from what our fulfillment centers would otherwise have to fill. Um, it's a bit of a trade-off there. There's another sort of interesting conversation that happens at Belk, which is we, we, we think about whether we're going to offer BOPIS during the highest retail periods. And the, the reason for that is a, is a, a couple of different reasons, but one is um, simply customers moving around in the stores, picking up things, making point of sale transactions means that our in, our certainty of our inventory levels is lower on that day than it is on other days, simply because it's physically moving around and people are walking to the POS to actually place orders holding stuff that they're going to buy. Um, so that's one reason why we're a little bit trepidatious about it. And the other one is, is simply the service level we give to the people in the store. So we, we wouldn't want our associates to have to make a decision between preparing for a customer who's coming in for a BOPIS order and serving one that's standing right in front of them at that moment. So, so that's kind of an interesting little conversation we have at Belk. And our thinking is evolving on how we handle that. Um, uh, I think Ashish covered the fulfillment center's labor preparation on the business side pretty well. They're, they're going to change their shift structure and, and go to set uh, more of a balanced three-day process. Uh, today, our first shift is heavier than our second and third, but at peak, we try to balance them all essentially equally, uh, which involves a ton of planning and training. Uh, on the IT side, there's a, there are several changes that we're making, and I think some of them are relevant to the panel we have here. Uh, one of the one of the big changes that Belk is making is we're this year we're switching in store fulfillment to using a mobile device uh, for the picking, and Manhattan was a key partner to enable that. Um, uh, the other thing we're doing is we're switched to Manhattan's Active Omni platform, which is cloud native, and so what we're expecting from that that change is a strategic improvement in its ability to scale. Uh, so if I need to add you know, many, many users, that system should be able to absorb it much easier than our previous system. I can recall a few late nights there building new servers last year where uh, <laughs> I believe the cloud will be able to handle that uh, in a much smoother way simply because it's architected with that in mind. Um, on our WMS and order management side, we have, uh, we, we do kind of the usual care and feeding, but one of, one of the other things that we do that I think a lot of folks do is we, we increase our staffing level pretty significantly and we bring them on site. So I'm going to physically have people in our warehouse that are IT experts on all shifts for, for about 10 or 14 days, somewhere in that range. And on our order management and our store fulfillment side, we will have on site, at least in our headquarters, on site staff covering two, two and a half shifts for, for probably about 20 days. So. Excellent. That's really great insight. Thank you for that. And Matt, if I can kind of continue, uh, what do you, you know, when you get to season peak, what, what's most important from a business perspective 
you have this conundrum of trying to balance customer satisfaction versus sales revenue or profit. You know, does the business make a conscious uh, adjustment during peak, or is it just heads down and keep trying to do the same? No, we make uh, major changes, and of course, th this is one of those scenarios too, where where we of course want to deliver on every single one of the goals, right? So the the goal of lowest cost and and fastest and best service to the customer certainly are in a bit of conflict during this period. Uh, most of the changes that we've made in the last few years, and I think it's it's consistent with our strategic thinking, is we're we're trying more and more to serve the customer better. So we're trying to be faster, we're trying to be more responsive, and we're trying to be more accurate. Uh, with most of the stuff that we're doing. And the, the reason for that is because we have, there are many, many customers in that you will only see during this period. So if their only experience with Belk is placing an order uh, on, let's say, on our e-com site, you know, during uh, during our peak period, and they feel like it's taken a long time to arrive, or it wasn't packaged the way they wanted it, or it wasn't uh, um, accurate, then we we think we we've given that customer a poor impression of us and and we think not an accurate one so what we've been trying very hard to do is get faster and better uh, at all of these things with that said though there's a tension uh, that you alluded to which is a sim simply that we we can't like uh, lose the farm for this so uh, we are you know we shift more volume to store fulfillment that store fulfillment costs more than the fulfillment center um, but on the other hand, they have more firepower during significant periods. Like we can t we can draw on far far more people to service the customer faster. So so the changes we put in place certainly allow us to do more store fulfillment. But we have also uh, in the mobile picking that we're doing in store fulfillment now is is a major improvement in productivity and accuracy. So we're we're trying to sort of do both at once. We're trying to be efficient and serve the customer the best. Hey, Ashish, any comments, uh, additional thoughts around that topic? Um, no, I think Matt already covered most of it, but the only couple of things I noticed is from our standpoint, we don't change um, our thinking from the peak standpoint. The only thing that changes is, and we'll probably cover it later as well, um, is more around the the traffic that's at the store, especially the week following Black Friday, um, that impacts and uh, influences the decisions that we make in terms of providing the right customer satisfaction. So that plays, that especially that week and the week um, towards the end of peak, those are kind of like critical for us in terms of uh, making sure because the traffic is a lot higher during those times. Um, so we need to make sure that we are not overburdening the, um, the stores so they are not able to uh, satisfy their uh, customers or that we are not uh, over promising to the customer and then not able to meet those. So that kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a trade off that you got to go through during that time. Excellent, thank you. So, Amy, quite a question for you. You're the, the director of product who has many customers and has a kind of a broader insight than many of us do. Uh, how do you see your clients leveraging Active Omni at peak? Are there any kind of new innovations, things that they're doing at this time of year? Yeah, I think some of them are uh, specific to peak and I think some of them are um, you know, happening, have been happening over the last, you know, 12 to 24 months of changes um, in the, the industry and a, a lot of it driven off of um, cus meeting customers' expectations, right? I think we all kind of have lots of data points around consumers' expectations are changing and as retailers we see a drive towards um, a number of initiatives that really fall into what a um, this meet your customer how and when they want to um, engage with you, right? And with that, we see much more um, exposure around um, options such as same-day delivery, um, delivery slotting, right? So being able to have, pick my delivery time, um, 
eco, um, some of our customers in uh, the European mar market, we're seeing um, the usage of, uh, and the, uh, some of this is all augmenting, you know, uh, the, the fulfillment network and how you can deliver, right? Eco-friendly options such as bike couriers, um, lockers, integrations with lockers for pickup um, to reduce the need of um, the uh, store associate or the labor for processing BOPIS um, at the moment the customer comes in the store. So we see some of our customers doing um, mostly in pilot phase right now, but locker um, pickup. Um, we also see some um, innovation around leveraging uh, alternate pickup locations, so maybe not my store, but uh, you know the train station, uh, the subway station, um, where uh, some of our customers are providing these options to pick up um, product, you know, when they're on the way their way home from uh, uh, from work, or when they're going to be um, in a particular area for another reason. I and mean, I think tying into this is uh, definitely an evolution of uh, the promise. Right, the promise is getting more precise, and the promise is earlier. Right, so if we look back five years ago, or even in some cases today, um, there's still uh, situations where I'm, I, I might not see a estimated delivery date until I'm in the final um, final phase of checkout. Um, but definitely a push and uh, evolution around providing more precise dates from a delivery perspective and providing them earlier in the shopping uh, journey. Um, I think Matt um, mentioned this or, or touched upon this. We definitely see um, at peak um, the adoption of significantly higher volumes of ship from store orders. Um, so again, like five years ago, ship from store, if there's no inventory in the DC, okay, I'll start looking at the store. I, you know, there's a big um, push, or we see many customers looking at the store as um, the uh, a way to augment DC capacity um, during peak. Um, and some folks are, are specifically staffing for that, as, as as Matt mentioned with Belk. There's they're not the only customer that's doing that. We see that um, in many areas when the store is starting to be used as. Um, basically uh, another fulfillment location uh, to augment DC capacity. So if I have a backlog of two days order, two, day, uh, two days of shipments in the DC, um, letting, uh, letting me use the stores as fulfillment locations uh, to meet, especially these um, aggressive promises from a delivery date perspective. Um, we also see when it comes to the store, looking at um, order margins by leveraging, you know, predictive analysis and machine learning related to the store performance, the depth of inventory in the store. So when should I use the store? Right? It's not just uh, about inventory. Oh, there's inventory in the store, and I have capacity. I'm going to use the store. Right? Is it cheaper to ship it from the store? Um, is that inventory deep in the store? Is that um, store a high performer and I'm sure they're going to be able to fulfill it on time. So evolution on that side. And then finally, I think as you can imagine, um, with the increased use of store inventory being exposed online, you know, inventory accuracy um, because becomes an area of focus, right? So I think there's been much more conversation over the last uh, six months to a year than that I, than I've ever had when it comes to store and RFID initiatives in the store, um, because once we start leveraging that store inventory um, that is notoriously inaccurate uh, for store fulfillment, um, there, we're seeing this investment and push when it comes to improving the accuracy of store inventory. Excellent, thank you. And so, I, you know, there's a nice segue from you're finishing up talking about inventory and the comment that Matt made earlier about the, the accuracy of inventory decreasing just with the sheer footfall through the stores through peak. So a question to Ashish, you know, when you by opening up store inventory, apart from this challenge to keep it accurate during the peak, uh, have there been other challenges that you've seen or experienced? Store inventory, um, like everything everyone says about the store inventory is true. It's great and it's a nightmare. Um, it um, it does provide a lot more flexibility in terms of serving the customer in the right way, in the quickest way. Sometimes our customers are within like five miles of a store. 
um, I can just fulfill it from there. Um, it also creates a problem, um, like the challenges part that you talked about, um, because now I need to make, and Amy had, was right on point about this whole inventory accuracy uh, and maintaining the right inventory levels. Um, RFID, like Amy mentioned, could be one of the solutions. Uh, it's been like everyone has been waiting for it to happen, but it has just not happened yet. Um, but accurate inventory is so much important. A lot of our focus during peak is to make sure we can reflect the right inventory numbers uh, as soon as we can. So as soon as the item is sold in the store, someone picked it up, um, we got to make sure we can just communicate it as fast as we can back to e-commerce so we don't promise the same inventory to someone else. So it, it does provide a lot more flexibility. It has helped us a lot, uh, especially in our um, assortment that we carry in our stores. And if you have been to our stores, you would know that uh, we don't really carry a lot of inventory in each store uh, for a particular size. Uh, since we go by the size and the color, it doesn't, we don't have too much depth over there to kind of uh, use in terms of if one unit is gone, we might have others. Um, so we, we have to make sure that we have inventory as accurate as possible, but for customers, it's pretty awesome. Um, they can get uh, shipments faster. It's good for us. In a lot of cases, it makes it cheaper um, for us to ship. It does create the split shipment issue, um, but that's part of the game. Excellent. Thank you. So, Matt, I'm going to follow up with a question for you. We, you know, if you go beyond the inventory, we actually look at the ship from store process and the, you know, you're potentially uh, quite a substantial uplift in the ship from store volume. Uh, what sort of challenges does that pose for the, the store teams during the period? I mean, do, do you actually limit the number of carriers that you sh you ship with from store? Yeah, do you max out and say there's a maximum number of shipments per store that you'll allow in any given day? Just curious if there's any insights you could share. That's a good question. Uh, we don't have any limitation on the number of carriers. We, we use, allow our logic to drive that on the basis of who we've partnered with. Um, obviously, there are some store locations that are served by some carriers and not by others, but that, that's really the only limitation we put on the carrier side. However, uh, in terms of volume and challenges for the store itself, there's, there's significant staffing issues and there's, there's issues around timing. So I, I think there are, because and I think Ashish alluded to this as well. Uh, basically, everything related to fulfillment, distribution centers do better, like all of it, inventory, speed, you name it. So one of the challenges that stores have, um, inventory accuracy is a big problem. So there's a frequent issue with skips, like an order that has to go to another facility to be fulfilled or has to be attempted multiple times. Another issue that happens in the stores is simply uh, timing uh, and, and, and really this ties into staffing levels, right? So it, it's a bit challenging to send a, an expedited order to a store at 2 p.m. and think that they're going to guarantee they'll get it done by 5, right? So it's a higher risk proposition to try to get them to fulfill on a tight time scale. Um, uh, and then I think... Um, I think lastly is, is, is simply this, the, the speed of op operating. So the store facility is basically laid out for the customer, not for a picking and an inventory operation, right? So it's, it's difficult and takes longer just to simply find things. So those are some of the challenges. And so we manage those in multiple different ways. I mean, and many, many of these involve sophistication around our decisions to send them orders and how many to send. So we do have limits on how many a store will have, will have be asked to process. Um, and our new machine learning capability allows us to make decisions about how accurate a particular store is in certain, even down to certain categories. So for instance, our logic would be able to look and see, you know, this particular store is somehow really good at finding things in the men's department, but isn't good at women's. So it will literally preferentially send the men's things over women's things. It might send the women's to some other store or to a fulfillment center. So, um, so we're trying to do a lot of a lot of stuff to to manage that to give them the best opportunity for success. That's excellent, really interesting. And you were kind of magically leading into the question I was going to ask about. Uh, Amy mentioned earlier your know, use of artificial intelligence 
to start to make decisions uh, in terms of you know, where to source from, uh, you know, what makes the best thing in terms of cost versus customer satisfaction. Uh, so quick question, Ashish, you know, from your perspective, do, do you consciously adjust the sourcing logic during the season peak? Uh, just curious if there's anything that you you get you do to sort of try and make things work better when you're under stress. We do. Um, we don't have all the tools that we would like to have, and hopefully we'll have next year. Um, the ones that uh, Matt was talking about, we'll probably have those next year. But um, for what we have right now, we do have a planning session that we do with our store ops uh, advisory group and IT and e-com and try to figure out like um, what's the best way to serve the customer. We adjust our um, logic based on that discussion. Um, usually it's something related to capacity, how we have to adjust the store's capacity because um, like most traditional retailers, most of our sales are actually in the store. Uh, e-com is a growing part, but it's a small part that's growing fast. So we do not want to uh, impact the in-store experience and want to make sure that uh, we, we maintain that part of the business um, and don't deteriorate the customer service on that side. However, we do want to make sure that uh, we continue to work on our e -com. So like the staffing part that uh, Matt mentioned earlier, that plays out here as well. And um, depending on like for peak, pretty much everyone is looking for more people. We try to hire, hire a lot more people, uh, temporary workers in our fulfillment centers uh, we also try to do it in the stores uh, and then adjust capacity to make sure they, the stores can cope up with the demand uh, of the holiday season. So the sourcing logic does play a role in there. We always prefer, of course, to fulfill the orders from fulfillment centers. Um, then we try to look into the stores, but uh, it's just how much we want to rely on the, uh, on the stores is the question. Excellent. Thank you. So now I'm going to change tack. I mean, this is retail uh, and it, it's the rule of life that things will go wrong. Uh, and I, so I, I wanted to, to get a chance. So Matt, if I ask you, you know, when, when you do see a kind of a breakdown in either the, the warehouse or uh, a store fulfillment processes, what what sort of things do you have in place to notify you that there are issues happening and kind of methods to try and help inform customers that something's going wrong, that there might be a delay? Yeah, good question. So, uh, I mean, just in terms of monitoring in general, we have, I mean, as everyone does, we have a significant amount of sophistication in our reporting around order aging and uh, relative to the uh, customer commitment. Um, but things go wrong. They always do. And so there's a couple of different things we do about that. I think one one of them is when we notice these, we try to react to them earlier, like, well, we can still meet the customer commitment. So that gives us some leverage where we can potentially do things. So we have, you know, many stores that are in our fulfillment network plus several FCs. So there's, there's sometimes the best option is to shift the volume for that particular order for a, a bunch of orders to another facility. Um, we will take that action if we can. Uh, but if we're looking at it and we're still seeing we're not going to meet the the original commitment to the customer, we will, uh, every time we can, We uh, and this is a last resort, obviously, but when it's going to happen, we prefer to tell the customer up front. Um, our finding is that the customers are, I would almost say, shockingly understanding if you tell them, and they are also understandably not understanding if you don't. So our, our, our finding is if you tell a customer, hey, your package will be delayed a couple days, we're going to, uh, you know, we'd like you to come visit our stores for such and such discount or whatever, um, and, and you'll still get your package, shipping is free or whatever, and then, uh, then the customer reacts quite well to that type of messaging. Um, what they don't react terribly well to is to find out we're late by us being late, you know, so by getting the package after whatever they were planning to have the stuff for. So those, those are just a couple things we do. Excellent. I, we're, we're, this hour is going incredibly quickly, so I'm going to fire a couple of final questions and then we'll open it up to the floor. So, uh, Ashish, if I could ask you, you know, the, inevitably, especially somebody involved in clothing at this time of year, 
is going to look at the, the challenge of returns very carefully. Are there things that you do to plan to manage the increase in volume of returns that happens during this period? Um, well, so returns is kind of part of the part of the puzzle anyway. So we got to deal with uh, deal with it. We do have uh, mo like most of the returns that customer ships comes over to our DC, so we can manage that as a fulfillment center a lot a lot smoother. Um, if it comes, they but do, we do provide them the flexibility. They they can go and just return it to the store, whichever uh, is closest to them, if they want to. Um, we provide them all the flexibility that they can. Um, however, if as far as the the amount of return is concerned, we got to manage that more. I believe from a sales standpoint, and we try to head, handle it on the front. If the customer is buying, if he buys the right um, right merchandise, the chances are the return chances will be fewer. That kind of advises into our philosophy about what products to have, what colors to carry, what uh, sizes to carry, um, what promotions to offer. So all that kind of leads in from the front end all the way to the back end. And if the customer wants to do it, we'll provide them all the all the flexibility that they have. Excellent. So. Matt, I'm going to you know, question. You know, let's start with yourself, Matt. And you know, are there any sort of, if you look at what you've done over the last couple of years, is there anything that you're still kind of looking at and thinking, mm, in the next couple of years, I'd like to change or get something new to help manage this process more different, differently? Uh, there's, I mean, probably a bottomless uh, uh, trove of ideas that we've all got here. <laughs> but I, I would say over the next two or three years, our, our big ones are we're we're trying to get into the machine learning both for allocation and for uh, inventory exposure, um, so that we can get way more sophisticated around that. A Amy touched on a few of those, so I'm not necessarily going to circle back unless we get some specific questions. But but some of the key ones for us that I'll just touch on are. Um, sending things to facilities where they're likely to have success. This is especially important for stores and less so for FCs, but you know it has to do with the, the store's statistical success level in, in certain categories. The, the other, I think, thing that we're looking forward to having a big impact for us on, uh, uh, on our profitability is allocating inventory that, out of stores that are deep and not out of stores that are shallow. So that what, what this allows us to do is sort of minimize any risk of markdowns and, and clearance items. So it, it's a profitability improvement, even though it's often not, in those cases, going to geographically the optimal place. So those are a couple of things that we're looking at in the near future. There's, there's, a, there's another big program that we're putting in place that we think is going to be a big thing for us, which is we're, we're going to change it so that our e-com inventory is is participating in the store replenishment process, which, uh, I mean, depending on how retail-y the folks on the call are, that it, it, probably what you should be thinking is simply that we will be able to replenish our stores even at small unit quantities out of essentially omni inventory. So we'll, we'll put more inventory into our fulfillment center, but then we'll be able to employ that inventory in stores in a, in a more, you know, more automated and simple way. And, and so the benefit to us would be our initial buy of inventory could be a little bit lower, but we would still have confidence we're going to make all the sales because we know that we can replenish uh, in a very rapid turnaround method. So those are a couple of things we're looking at. Uh, something maybe a little farther out is we, we don't have a sophisticated ship to store operation right now. Um, and it's been discussed. We, we may go down that path um, as well at some point. Uh, but today we actually only offer pickup in store from inventory that's already there. Not, we're not doing like a just in time or a, uh, a ship from store A to store B for someone to pick up type situation. Excellent. That was a really great sort of run through of you know, potential ideas for people to think about. Uh, at this point, we are beginning to get to the, the, you know, the tail end of the session. I'm going to ask Matt Domenico if we have any questions that have come in. Uh, at this time, no, we don't, we don't have any. At this time, we don't have any questions. Uh, I suspect you probably addressed a number of them as you were going through uh, a number of those scenarios, so that was probably really helpful. Um, 
if what I can do is I can likely go ahead and um, unmute everybody so that if anyone has any questions that you'd like to ask verbally, we'd be happy to uh, address those now as well since we don't have any in the, the control box. Okay, so everyone's unmuted at this point. So does, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to let us know. Okay. Okay, it doesn't no, look no, like you're in any. Doesn't sound like we're any questions, and I realize that we're nope. getting towards the top of the hour that we'd set aside as the maximum for the webinar. Uh, so, you know, you've got the key takeaways there plan strategically, uh, you know, plan to, in the combination with customer services and the support team fulfillment team together. Uh, and keep on learning and refining year on year. It's a, it's it, as Matt said. It's a, it's bottomless than the things that you can uh, keep doing and re reviewing and improving upon. I uh, so I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Ashish, to Matt Henry, and to Amy for you know taking time and contributing their knowledge and experience. Uh, Matt Domenico, any closing thoughts or comment from yourself? No, I think that's about it. I do want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their schedule to join us today. And once again, the session has been recorded, so um, we'll be happy to share that with you if um, if you'd like to get a copy of that. Um, thanks, David. Yeah, Appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you all. All right, you all have a wonderful day.